kids stand up and sing along. In the dark, when I feel like I'm worlds apart, I remember that I'm in your heart with you. You're all I've got. If I really had to count the cost, not a second or a minute's lost with you. Never ever change, you're the great I am. You always stay the same, and I won't forget. You are the flower in your head, your word is gone in the back. Why my strength in the back? my eyes, you're the finger and you're fine for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. never ever change, you're the great I am, you always stay the same, and I won't forget, you are the flower in your hands, your word is gone and you're why my strength is without it, my victory Sometimes you just have to turn on your mic. You can't wait on anyone else to turn it on. Thank you for being here at Encounter Church. Good morning to each and every single one of you. If you're a first-time guest, we want to say a very special welcome to you, either you or if you've been around for a long time and you have not yet downloaded our app, we'd love for you to do that. EncounterChurch.com forward slash app. It's a way that you can follow along in the message notes today. It's also a way almost um, a couple of times a week. We just get even prayer requests that come directly through the app that allow us to encourage you, minister you, and really specifically just pray for you. So we hope that you will download the app to engage with us. As you get to know us, we certainly want to get to know each and every single one of you. Happy summer to you. Happy July 4th. Hope you had a great week. Did you? Hope that you did. Um, there was actually, the, the sun came out this week. I don't know if you noticed that yesterday, but it came out. And I'm glad, certainly, that it did. We're going to sing a few more songs together, then I'm going to come back up and continue in our message series that we began several weeks ago. Let's continue to sing together. And I know that today is going to be a great day for each and every one of us. No king, no power, no rule can stand if it's the great I am. No army, no weapon, no evil can stand before the great I am. Come on, sing it with me. No kingdom, no power, no ruler can stand against the great I am. No harm, no evil can stand against the great I am. No sickness, no pain, no depression can stand against no hunger, no fear, no injustice can stand against no kingdom, no power, no ruler can stand against the great I am. You 
overflow in the rest. Your word is gold in the valley. You are my strength in the battle. My victory in the chaos. You are my peace in the mess. My only drink, fearless. I take a stand. in your command I know tomorrow when the pressure rushes in you'll be there to rescue me again what a mighty God what a mighty God you are yours and yours alone the song of heaven and my soul will sing the same Jesus Christ the name above all names what a mighty God what a mighty
when the weight of life begins to fall. On the name of Jesus, I will call. For I know my God is in control. And his purpose is unshakable. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what I see. My hope will always be your promises to me. Now I'm casting out all fears. For your love has set me free. My hope will always be your promises. As I walk into the days to come, I will not forget what you have done. For you have supplied my every need. Oh, and your presence is enough for me. Oh, it doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter. us up. It's what keeps us going. No matter what we face, you've given us promises to each and every one of us in our own lives. And as a church today, God, I pray that we just rest in those promises of freedom, those promises of hope, of joy, of peace. 
may we just rest in your name. And it's in Jesus' name we say, amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you know that last song that we sang, but this morning, and sometimes when I speak here on Sunday morning, I'll sneak out the house quite early, and I went to the Starbucks just down the road in Norwood, and when that song came on, um, I just had to play it over and over a few times, so that might have been like the eighth time I've heard that song. Do you, Are you one of those people that like to play songs over and over, right? And, and if you are, there's a chance that your spouse really doesn't like it, Right? <laughs> And there were even certain movies I remember growing up thinking, I want to watch this again. And my brother was like, if you play that again, right? I can't say the next thing he said, but like, if you play that again, I, I just love that song, right? Um, it doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I feel. My hope will be in what? In promises. And so many times we find ourselves so easy at a place in our journey, at a place in our life, relationships, marriage, work, where we do not see tomorrow. We don't have hope, right? One of the reasons why I love for thousands of years now, we can say the local church has gathered, right? Be it in homes in certain parts of the world, be it on Sunday morning, be it on Saturday night, the church gathers together because we have hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. And I don't know what your, what your spiritual journey is, if you've grown up in church, or if this is maybe the first time in your life that you find yourself going to church on a regular basis. We have hope, and that hope is in eternal life, and it's found through Jesus. And so I'm so glad that you're giving church, and you're giving God a shot in your life, if that's you. I just want to say, I just want to, in some ways, in, a, in an awkward way, congratulate you. And say, well done. I'm, I'm glad that you're giving it a shot. And we hear stories of even people listening online. I've had a, an email somewhat recently where someone said, listen, I'm, I'm not ready in there in my journey to, to come to church, but I can listen. And so if that's you listening, I just want to tell you that song is so, so meaningful, not just to me, but to you. I love even when the band cut out for a little bit, we can just hear your voices singing, right? Um, whether you like that or not, we can hear you singing, right? Um, We're glad that you're here at Encounter Church, and I'm going to continue in this series that we've started over the past couple of weeks. And what I find very interesting about the Bible is that it's really, really real. In fact, so many stories in the Bible are even R-rated. I have found myself in the morning, like, you know, reading a Bible story and going, oh, wow, maybe I shouldn't, like, read the rest of this, right, to my kids. And in in, in the month of August, I'm going to be working through the book of Daniel. And so I hope that you'll you'll come when you're here and not on vacation, right? And I hope that you'll listen in online. We're going to be working through the book of Daniel. And just recently, I was reading chapter 1 and then chapter 2 to my kiddos, reading them the story. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't read that part. The, what I love about the Bible is because of its realness, we can relate. Now, I've been in spiritual context. I confess, even in seminary, I've been in, in Bible teachings and listening to pastors throughout the years going, what are they saying, right? I don't understand it. Maybe, do they understand it? Cause, or does anyone in the room understand it? But when we read the Bible, especially the narratives in the Bible, they're just incredible stories. And in so many of the stories that we find that are so real, so honest, so transparent, we find, you know what? Maybe my family's not that bad at all. Right? There are some, some things in the scripture, even that we'll read today, that go, you know what? I'm not alone. And because the Bible is real, that is the reason that it's R rated, because life is hard. No family is perfect. 
When we even see the scripture and some of the stories of maybe you've heard the, the description, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how God fulfilled so many of his promises that we just sang about through these families. Today, we're going to look into a story that had to do with Jacob and Esau. And one of the interesting things about their family is that they had a lot of drama. If you got drama in your family, say, "Uh uh-huh. Now, if you didn't, yes, you do. The the drama may be beside you if you didn't confess that, right? Or maybe the drama is you. If you're like, no, we're fine. No, it's not fine. Like every family has, has struggle and every family has, has, has drama. And it's because you and I were born. This isn't, this is a Christian worldview. This is a Christian principle of our faith, but we were born into a life that is imperfect. And I've said here on this stage and in personal context before, and especially in counseling matters, you don't have to teach poor choices, do you? They just happen. We were not born into a perfect world. We were born into a world that is full of sin. And we call sin anything, any attitude, thoughts, or actions that are far from or not pleasing to a holy and perfect God. We have to talk. We have to be taught to do good, don't we? Right? We have to talk to do good. We don't have to teach a child or anyone to do what is wrong. It is in our nature to do what is wrong. Today we're going to be talking about decisions and the decisions that we make. The decisions that you make can be a bridge to a future that you desire or a barrier to the future that you desire. Let me say that again. The decisions that you and I make can be a bridge to the future that we desire or they will be a barrier to the future that you desire. The problem with decisions is that they happen moment by moment and they happen quickly, right? Moment by moment, day by day. Most of the decisions that you and I make on a daily basis, in fact, I don't know how many you've made already today, but you've made a lot of decisions already. Now, not to overlook those or not to overplay those either. Some of those are, are, are seemingly meaningless, right? So many of the decisions that you and I make that we do not think will have an impact, they do. The problem that we all face, not just you or the person beside you, but the problem that we all face is that we all struggle to see the implications of our decisions until we experience them in the future, right? We, we don't know what the long-term impact of these decisions are. We don't think maybe it's a big deal, but maybe a month A year, years later, you look back and you have regrets. Most people that have regrets when they look back in their life, these are small decisions that have big implications. And I'm not talking about the decision of whether or not to take that new job, because immediately you know in a decision like a job change, a career change, or stepping out of a job to step into a, maybe you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to create a new business. I'm not talking about those types of decisions, or like the decision of who you should marry, or the decision of the relationship that you're in, how it should be addressed or how it should be fixed. Or the decision for you, if you're like, hey, should we, should we go, to, go to private school for our kids or public school? These are decisions that we're hit with um, that we know the implications of. We know they're big decisions and they weigh immediately heavy on you. I'm talking about the other decisions. The ones that we make on a daily basis when we get up, when we go to work the conversations that we have, the phone calls that we make, the text messages that we send or don't send. A year, two, five years later, then and only then do we experience the implications of those decisions. Some decisions in the Bible that we can read are somewhat similar to the decisions that you would say when you look at your family and you go, how could they? Or those moments when you look at maybe someone else's life and think, what? What, what, are, what are they thinking? To me, it's very frustrating. If I do stay awake in a movie, I'm sorry, Rachel. If I do stay awake in a movie, which I typically don't, right? I, I, I'm that guy that wants to talk through the movie. I'm sorry if that bothers you, but I'm like hitting pause. Like, Rachel, what did they say? She's like, just, just hit play. No, no, no. What did, I, I need to catch this part. I talk through the movie, provide commentary through the movie. I'm a talker, right? And I like to do that. Some of you that are are hearing me describe that, you're like, yeah, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with talking through movies? And, but that's me at times. The other thing I get really frustrated is the characters, right? 
And I know that like there's no good story without tension, right? There's no good plot without some sort of tension that needs to be revealed. But that moment when you're watching like a couple, you're like, hit pause. Or not, at least that's me, right? Rachel may say, give me the remote, you know? I'm like, what? All you have to say is this. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like when you just tell the character, listen, if I could just rewrite this, but then if they said that, then the movie would be over. And it just wouldn't make any sense, right? So there's always this tension around what to say, what not to say. And you see the implications of other people's lives, but we don't see it for your own. There's a story in the scripture with one of the promises of God that was fulfilled through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau's story is found in the very first book of the Bible, This is recorded um, thousands of years ago, uh, found in chapter 25 of Genesis. I'm going to read a few verses, but before I read the few verses, I want to explain a little bit of the context. Jacob and Esau were fraternal twins. And what's recorded throughout the, uh, throughout the Bible, throughout the scripture that we have, is that they did not have a good relationship. From birth all the way through their adulthood, even categorized in other in other like writings inside the scripture and outside the scripture, even the way that they died there's there were there were, it 's very evident that there was tension even at the very end of their lives, that they did not have a great relationship. And there were some things that both of them did, both Jacob and Esau, because you can, in some perspective, see Jacob's side of the story and think, how could Esau? But in Esau's side of the story, if you just take some time and jump out and kind of zoom out of the story, you could say, hey, Jacob, this was your fault, man. You saw this coming. They did not have a good relationship. Even one of the Bible verses that I'm not going to read today says that uh, Jacob had a favorite and his favorite was his mom. And mom had a favorite and her favorite was Jacob. But Esau, Esau was a hunter. And um, who liked the hunter? Dad. Isaac, the Bible even says that Isaac had favoritism towards Esau. And the reason he did was because he was more like him. Now, as a parent, I, I would even... Um, be uncomfortable at the conversation, right? Talking about my kids of which one I liked more, right? And it's just an, uh, even an uncomfortable thought or co- in the, an uncomfortable question. But the reality is when we see this story, is that mom liked him and dad liked him. I just feel like, wow, are you kidding me? That's crazy. That's not right in and of itself. But they, but the reason is because they were so different. Jacob and Esau were so different. One parent related to one and the other parent related to the other. So this wasn't just a tension between Jacob and Esau. This was a tension around their parents and who they preferred and who they understood. The Bible story says that Esau loved to hunt, but Jacob liked to stay home. It's like saying one kid likes sports and the other one's like, why do they exist? Right? And when one parent says, well, I want to go throw the ball. And one kid says, I don't like throwing the ball. Right? And all of a sudden there's a gap. There's a gap in connection, right? Because you're different people. And so this is like not a crazy family story because this exists inside your home. It exists inside my home. And so there's incredible tension, not just between Jacob and Esau, but between their parents. In Genesis chapter 25, I'm going to read in starting in verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, there you go. He didn't like to hunt. He just liked to cook, right? Once Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. Wouldn't you, right? He ate and he drank and then he got up and he left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now just these six verses, I read and go, what are you thinking? This is that moment in the movie that you're like, did that really just happen? What are you thinking? What are you doing? And it seems like a silly, this is not an anecdotal story. This idea of the birthright and its ability to be given up or sold was not uncommon. 
in today's world, I don't know, I, I, I doubt very highly you've had a conversation with your sibling um, about selling the rights to when your parents passed away, who's going to get what, right? You're kind of, and, and, and if you have, I understand because we have to, you know, we have to prepare for those life transitions and your parents passing away, but I doubt it has been over food. And so you look at this story, you're like, what? No, 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 no. What just happened? What just happened? Esau out hunting a long time. He comes home hungry, and what does he want? He wants food, and he looks to his brother and says, give me some food. Now, a really funny story. You see in parentheses, at least in most scriptures, that's why he's called Edom. This Hebrew word literally means red. Another chapter that uh, kind of um, recounts the history of their birth says that Esau was a hairy man. How would you like that to be said of you, right? Tell me about Esau. He's hairy. Well, it was not just that he was hairy, he was a red-headed man. And here we learn that he was not just red-headed, but he was called red. In the Hebrew, the word Edom means red. And here it's about the color of the stew, that it actually became a nickname. He became known for not just having red hair, but he became known for making a decision over a cup of red stew. Now, we look at this story, we think about this story, we think how silly, how crazy, what was he thinking? Again, like that movie moment that we don't understand why they make the decisions that they make. But here's the reality. You and I are just like that. We make decisions based on what we, help me out, want. We make decisions based on what we want. And we make decisions based on how we feel. That's right. Some of you are saying it, right? We do it every single day. When I'm meeting with married couples or married couples to be, or couples that have been married for 10, 15, sometimes longer, I always have this thought, and I verbalize it too. If we could just be selfless, this problem would go away. I have never been able to say anything different than that being the number one remedy. If we could just be selfless. And listen, I preach this to my own self. This preacher right here preaches to him own self. If I could be selfless, this would go away. If she could be, I'm not talking about my wife, because she's perfect. If she could be selfless, I mean, like once a year she messes up, right? Because I know, like, the Bible's true. Like, everyone makes mistakes. He makes them annually. I make them daily. I love you, honey. I don't know if I get some points right there. She's probably rolling her eyes back in the back. If he could be selfless, if she could be selfless, but the better thing, if I could be selfless, we live and we act and we make decisions, both short term, both for today, both for tomorrow, based on what we want. I wrestle with this every single day. And so do you. And it's not that we should say if he could or if she could, because that's pointing the finger, right? But if you think about yourself and how many decisions you make, they are based on what you desire. They are based on what you want. Even sometimes when we say, well, I'm really making this for the best interest of the other person, we still, by default, look out for ourselves. I don't know, but if, if you get hangry, that's like, a, right, that's when you're hungry and you are um, angry and you kind of put that together, whether you're angry and you happen to be hungry or you're hungry because you're angry. I don't know how that works, but we can make decisions when things are not well inside of us. And I'm not just talking about being hungry, but this is a moment in reality, the hunger exposed the problem. The hunger exposed the problem that he despised his brother. The hunger exposed the problem that he also despised his parents. And he, there was so much family tension, even though his father loved him and preferred him in some ways. In some ways, this doesn't mean that his dad did not like Jacob. What this means is that there was a stronger connection. So this hunger wasn't just a problem. This hunger exposed the problem. Imagine saying, what do I care about my birthright? 
He was so hungry, he physically felt like he was about to die. Now, if you were in that situation, you would give up anything to survive. How hungry was he? I'm like, did he go on a on a 24-hour or 36-hour or 7-day hunt or safari? Did he assume he would kill a certain animal and be able to make a fire and kill it and roast it? We assume he was very unsuccessful in the journey. There's another assumption, another scholar writes, there's no way that Esau came back successful on his trip, right? He didn't kill anything, but why? Because he was so hungry. There's a good chance he barely made it back alive. When you think about that, imagine being out for seven days on some safari and you assume you're going to kill animals. You assume you're going to be able to cook at night and maybe salt preserve some of the other animals and carry them back with you. He had nothing. He came back famished. He could have come back near death literally in his weakest of weak moments. And there is an ability to lose brain function when you're hungry, right? Good research on that. And you're like, yeah, that's my excuse, right? <laughs> did you go on a seven day safari or did you just miss Duncan on the way home? Right? There's a difference, right? But I know when we're hungry, we can lose the ability to think. And Esau literally, it says he despised this last verse. I just read, he despised his birthright. I think he, there's a potential He despised his birthright before he gave it up. There was such family tension for a moment of pleasure. He's willing to give up the blessing of his family. This wasn't just money. This was the the, the spiritual God's blessing on his family. Later chapters even say that he broke a huge rule that God had set up for the Israelites. That they were not to marry outside of their tribe. And the Bible records how he married Canaanite women and how this would have even deeply, deeply, deeply troubled his dad, that he would go outside the commitment that the Israelites had made to God and the the command that God had had even given them, that he went outside and married outside. But yet later in his life, um, he still had a chance to get the birthright because anyone could have made up that story and he could have said, dad. Um, That never happened. I'm the firstborn. I deserve. And Jacob even later deceived his dad into giving him the birthright. But for a moment of pleasure, what clouds this decision? Not just hunger, but a poor relationship. Not just hunger, but resentment. Not just hunger, but you might could say, how could he do that? The same way you and I can do that. In other teachings, especially in the New Testament, after Jesus, um, after Jesus' life and his burial and his resurrection, there's a, a, a phenomenal teaching that records about the power of God's Spirit. You may hear, you, maybe you've heard it at baptisms, or you've heard it in, in different Christian teachings, even here on Sunday morning, the idea of the Trinity, that there is one God in, the, in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus died and was resurrected from the grave, um, the Bible records that he appeared to over 500 people. Many of his life stories were recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four accounts of his life. One of the final things that he taught about, not just during his life, but after his resurrection, was the Spirit. That even though Jesus was going to heaven and he was going to be away, that the Holy Spirit would be present and that the Holy Spirit was in fact God. Later, some New Testament writers say that the spirit of God that lives in us is opposed to the flesh. Okay. Now, the flesh is opposed to the spirit, and the spirit is opposed to the flesh. Now, the idea of the flesh that we learn from these teachings is that that is what you desire. That is like the carnal, fleshly, sinful things that you and I want. The things that we should not want, that we still want, right? The things that we know are not right, but that we still desire. These are contrary to the things that God desires. And so there's the desires of man and the desires of God. Literally here, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit. What's interesting is that it's impossible to please both. Physically, one of the other teachings in the scripture that says it's impossible to love both God and money. Just saying that one one's the, desires is truly to meet the desires of who yourself. And when you're looking to please yourself, it's hard to please your spouse. When you're looking to please and look after yourself, it's hard to meet the needs of your children. 
If you're looking after and preserving for yourself, it's hard to care for your parents. If you're looking only after yourself, it's hard to think about God. Esau, he was hungry. He was not thinking about Jacob. Esau was hungry, famished, potentially near death. He was not thinking about the blessing of God, just like you and just like me. When you're thinking about what you want, it's hard to think about others, much less God. How guilty are all of us? We all are. How do we change this? Our brain's default is not to preserve necessarily or look after success. Our brain's default is to preserve um, our own pleasure and avoidance of pain. Think about those two things. What you desire, you want pleasure and you want to avoid pain. Yes? No, I mean, let's just be real with that. That's what you want, right? You want to be happy. You could say it that way. Um, And you want to avoid pain. Right? That's part of your brain's design. You're going to walk out. If you see a door closing, what are you going to do? Just put your hand up, right? You're, not, you're going to do everything you can to avoid pain. The stove's on. As an adult, you're going to check it out, make sure it's kind of cool. You're going to do whatever you have to do to do those two things. Seek pleasure and make sure there's no pain. That's normal. Don't feel bad about that, by the way. I'm not over-spiritual. Don't feel bad about trying to protect yourself. <laughs> But the contrary to those two things are what? It's really hard to be focused on yourself and then also try to look at the needs and the potential for others. It's hard, isn't it? And in a moment, Esau, for the sake of food, Esau, in a moment, for the sake of his own desires, of his own flesh, gave up the blessing of God. It's tough because you and I can do that and not know that we're doing that. When I reflected even this week, thinking about this message, like what decisions am I making today that I will regret in five years? I honestly didn't know how to answer that question, but it did cause me to reflect and think. I haven't asked Rachel in a, in a different kind of way. Are, are there decisions I'm making right now? that you believe like maybe aren't good, like short term. And it's even hard to even have a conversation with someone that, that loves you about like, what am I doing now that I'll regret in 10 years? That's a, that's an interesting question to even ask yourself. And it's hard to actually know the answer. And sometimes those that love you the most find it most difficult to be honest with you. Right? What do we do? The three recommendations I want to make today, and these will be on the screen. The three recommendations I want to make today are hard, but they're necessary. And I really want to challenge you in your faith journey with God to discern this question. What is the wise thing to do? If we could jump into history for a moment, jump back into history with Jacob and Esau and go, Esau, time out. There's a lot of different ways to get food. This isn't the best way, right? He wasn't thinking five years down the road, 10 years down the road. In so many ways, I want this to call the time out of your life. And think about you and your own journey and the decisions that you're making and ask this question, what's the wise thing to do? The first recommendation to discern the answer to that question of what's the wise thing to do is this. Think long term, not short term. Now, Everything I said to you about seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and looking after yourself is all short term. And it's understandable. It's the way you and I wake up. It's the way you and I think. It's the way that we feel. We're not thinking about what the marriage is going to be like in 10 years. We're just trying to survive today. We just want today to be good, right? You live in the now, not in the then. And I understand that. And that's a struggle for all of us. But in decision makings, both small and big, think long term. If you think long-term about the type of environment you want your family to be, and you focus, and you you carve out time. This morning was incredible in some ways. I just sat at Starbucks and turned my phone over and for 30 minutes. By the way, 30 minutes is a long time of solitude. Anyone else think that's like misery, 30 minutes of just sitting? Like I did that. Like minute 27, I'm like, minute 28 is coming, right? Of just like reflecting and thinking in solitude. 
It's hard to do. It's hard to, but it takes carved out, quiet thinking about what's my life going to look like in five years, in 10 years. How do I think long-term about my kids? How do I think long-term about my finances? How do I think long-term about my relationship with God and the decisions I'm making today? Solitude is one of the biggest challenges on this. In fact, I was flying to see um, my uh, mom and my dad and pick up my kiddos from, from being with them for a week. And I noticed this young girl, she's probably 20, 21. She was sitting near us and she had a phone beside her. She sat there. And I, we were waiting on the plane for like 45 minutes. And I happened to notice like she never touched her phone. Hello, 2019. I noticed that a young person, I'm guilty. I was messing with my phone during notice that she never touched her phone. I'm like, I think I just want to be like peaceful. I wanted to go up to this random young girl and say, thank you for not grabbing your phone. I mean, nothing against your phone, but like, wow, I see someone just breathing in and out. And like, I'm forcing yourself to think long-term. It takes time because you live in the here, you live in the now. You're just, you're not worried about Monday. You just want Sunday to be good, right? Think long-term, not short-term, and it takes time and it takes solitude. The second thing is this, think with your mind, not with your heart. Think with your mind and not with your heart. Now, I've heard this a ton, and it's very easy to say, just go with your heart. And I want to say this, don't go with your heart. It's kind of a colloquial and even sometimes Christian thing to say, like, you're just going to go with your heart. And if you said that piece of advice, I'm sorry, I know I have two at times, but when I, when I think about this in terms of, of recommendations for you and I today, sometimes we can't go with our heart. Why? Because our heart is thinking about what we want and what we feel, not what is best. You and I need to think logically about what this means. And it may be even time to call in someone else and say, what do you think about this? To seek outside counsel. Even the Bible says that plans fail because of a lack of guidance, a lack of counsel. With a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. Think with your mind, not with your heart. Now listen, let me give a small disclaimer here. Can God, can the Holy Spirit, can he certainly give you a sense of inner peace in your heart and feel about what is best for you? Absolutely. Don't hear me say that like he, I mean, he certainly, God works in a sense of peace inside your heart. I know that he does, but sometimes if we go with our heart, we'd find ourselves in trouble because we want things that are not best for us. There's a verse in uh, the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament says, the heart of all things is deceitfully wicked. Right now, that's not a Bible verse that you quote before telling someone to go with their heart, right? Because our hearts are not always in the right place. Our hearts are looking out for ourselves and what we want and what we desire. But think long term with your mind. And finally, think about God and not yourself. Remember, I mentioned earlier, you cannot serve both God and money. What a fascinating Bible verse. There are rich people that love God. And there are poor people that love God. It is possible to do both. But the concept here is a warning that when our heart, and money is just an example, when our heart is focused on ourselves, it's really hard to think about what God wants. Even just asking this question, what does God desire of me? I mentioned I did uh, Nate and Melissa's wedding and one of the Final questions I shared during their wedding ceremony. It's like if you could ask this one question of your marriage. Just one question. Here it is. The one question of your marriage. What does God desire for us? And walk in that. Not what do I want? What does she want? What do we want? But what does God desire of us? That's what I mean when I say think about God and not yourself. It changes the daily decisions. It changes the answer to the question What's the wise thing to do? Thinking long-term requires solitude, not short-term. When you think about God and not think about yourself, it changes everything about the decisions that you and I make. Finally, the one decision that Jesus made that changed everything was the decision to give his life for you and I. Jesus died on the cross to offer the forgiveness of sin to anyone, 
anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord. One of my favorite Bible verses is that and the Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. So there's no past decision. There's no past moment. There's no past relationship that cannot be forgiven. There's no, there's nothing, not one thing you've ever said, not one thing you've ever done that cannot be moved on and moved into the future by your relationship with Christ. And the one decision that you and I can make that will be long-term and that will be best for us is the decision to follow Jesus with your life. So many of you have already made that decision. So many of you are on a faith journey where you're still making up that decision of what you want to do with your life. And I want to tell you, either through the app, through a prayer request, through, the, through reaching out to us through the app or stopping by starting point, there is a moment for you to make a decision. I want to follow Jesus with my life. You can do that today. And I've never talked to an individual, never talked to a soul that ever regretted making that decision to follow God with their life. Today can be a day where you make the decision that will change every future decision, your decision to follow Christ. But in order to answer the question, what's the wise thing to do? The final encouragement was that third one. Think about what God desires for you and not what you desire for yourself. Let's pray. Fathers, we think about what you desire for us. We are all guilty of Esau-like moments that happen daily. (laughs) Esau-like moments that happen and we look back into our past. We're all guilty of it. But I know because of your grace, because of your love, because of your mercy... And because of the forgiveness that you offer to us on the cross, that we can live for you in a better future. We can live a life of better decisions and fewer regrets because of you. So God, I thank you for that. May this story be a reminder to us, not just um, in this moment, but moving forward, that we can think long-term about our future. We can think about what you desire for us, not what we desire for ourselves. Thank you for being the example that we need, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. During this next song, we like to carve out a time and a space for us to sing and respond and reflect. And this next song is going to be as we stand and sing. Go ahead and stand and sing in this moment. We're going to do two things. Number one, just a time and a space for you um, as we sing to reflect on what God desires for you. And the second thing we're going to do is take an offering. And that offering for those that call Encounter Church Home, we're able to give back um, our financial gift to God that allows us to, number one, communicate that we love God and we worship God. And number two, it is able to communicate that we believe in the mission of God. And we're able to do in our community and for our community uh, what we believe God desires because of your financial gifts. And so thank you for giving to Encounter, those of you that have. I want to give you an update, by the way. Uh, We're in the middle of a 90-day giving challenge where we have a private donor. Some of you may know this story. Some of you may be hearing this for the first time. Uh, This space uh, is appraised between 1.2, 1.5 million, and we owe just above $300,000 on it because someone that loves Encounter Church has come alongside us and has agreed to to match every dollar that we give during this 90-day period, every dollar that we give, They're going to match it with $2. Now, if you think about how incredible that is, a matching gift is incredible. A matching gift is incredible. To match $2 for every dollar is really incredible. We've had over $75,000 given already in the last 45 days. Yes. We really want to be able to get to 100 because you can do the math on that, right? We want to get to $100,000 because $2 for that would be quite incredible. And we could potentially eliminate the debt. So thank you for those of you that have given already. We're going to continue to give through the rest of the summer. And so thank you for, for being a part of that. We are excited about what God's doing with that. If you have any questions about it, certainly feel free to ask us on the way out. Thanks for being in Encounter Church. Let's sing one more song together. And someone's going to come and close out our service in just a few moments.
to Greece when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the back the sea should I ever need your mind how I've been set free there is a cross that bears that blue another died for me
that's where you'll be. Count the joy from every night, cause I know that's where you'll be. Count the joy from every night, cause I know that's where you'll be. Count the joy from every night, cause I know that's where you'll be. for being at Encounter Church today. We hope today's message on making wise choices was helpful and hopeful to you. Feel free to stop by Starting Point if you have more questions about the service today or something that you heard. We'd love to help you out. Also, I want to remind you, we still have our event coming up July 13th for the hiking day and hiking trip. Feel free to sign up for that through the app or at Starting Point. Also, if you are a first-time guest, we have a special gift for you that we will give you at Starting Point as you leave today. So feel free to stop by for that as well. We hope you have a great rest of your Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you back next week. Take care. I can see the